This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Jenny Kim. After getting her undergraduate degree in genetics at UC Berkeley, Jenny saw the light and came to UCLA for her MD and her PhD in microbiology and immunology. Her surgery and internship and residency were at Harbor UCLA and her dermatology fellowship and residency were at UCLA, David Geffen School of Medicine. After an additional fellowship in Mohs micrographic surgery here, for anyone who's counting, the score is UCLA 7, Berkeley 1. <laughs> We're not done yet either. Yeah. <laughs> now Dr. Kim is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine and Dermatology at the David Geffen School of Medicine and Chief of Dermatology for the Greater Los Angeles Healthcare Services for Veterans Affairs. She's also co-director of the UCLA Aesthetic Clinic Dermatology Plastic Surgery and co-director of the Mohs Micrographic Surgery and Laser Fellowship. We're also proud that she's a member of CNSI. She's the editor of the Journal of Cosmetic and Laser Therapy and serves on a wide range of editorial, advisory, and society boards. If you or your family members would like to attend a great medical school, she's also on the admissions committee for ours. You can see her in the lobby after during the reception, in the reception afterwards. Among her many honors are the American Academy of Dermatology Award for Young Investigators, the SID Galderma Acne Research Award, the American Academy of Dermatology Leadership Award for Volunteerism, and being named the Dong Sung Pharmaceutical Foundation Medical Pharmaceutical Research Scholar. In her colloquium titled Science and Dermatology More Than Skin Deep, not up there yet, she'll discuss skin immunity and the sophisticated protective mechanisms that keep us healthy, as well as what happens when these mechanisms go awry. Please join me in a warm welcome for an outstanding scholar, teacher, colleague, and friend, Dr. Jenny Kim. So good afternoon. Thank you very much for being here. It's such an honor. Um, boy, when Paul asked me to do this, thank you, Paul, for inviting me and all of you who've organized, sent out all these flyers. I felt like I was like a movie star or something. Um, but my goodness, I, was, I, I found out what this was, and I was a little bit taken back. I'm not sure if I truly deserve to be here when I look at all the scientists uh, you know, before that came and spoke here. So um, I was a little bit worried about that, but I think that hopefully what I can share with you today is something that I really feel passionate about. So it's coming from my heart, and I think I can convince you um, that perhaps you can um, find out about a very interesting organ, the skin. I also am very excited because it's such a wonderful colloquium. Just very recently, I started to reach out to other people who are not in dermatology or immunology, uh, and the interaction that I've had on ca campus has been really remarkable. And I think this colloquium does what we should all be doing, really reaching out. I, we could be about 100 uh, uh, yards away, but really not know what we're doing. And so um, hopefully some of you will find what we're doing in dermatology exciting. And if it's not me, then, then you can reach out to some of my colleagues and we can really advance science on our campus in this amazing place. So thank you again for being here. Um, I'd like to start by introducing you to uh, an organ called the skin. And, and I'll go over the structure, the sophisticated mechanism of how the skin protects our body. And focusing really on uh, the physical structure, but also protective molecular and cellular mechanism that skin utilizes to protect our body. And I'll talk a little bit about response to UV, wound healing, and immune response. And while I'm talking about it, I'm going to tell you what happens if something goes wrong and then give you some examples of skin diseases that will really uh, give you a picture of what can happen if things don't go, don't, don't go right. 
and then end with um, giving you some introduction of what I talked about a little bit earlier. I reached out to, to other scientists on campus and I'd like to share with you what we're doing um, in terms of skin-related collaborative work and in interdisciplinary work on campus. So for those of you, or some of you, may not be familiar with skin, some people think of skin as just the mere covering of our body. But I have to tell you, it's not that simple. It's not like a saran wrap at all. In fact, it's very, very sophisticated. If you look at the histology of the skin, one can see the skin, the first layer, the epidermis, followed by the, uh, the dermis. The dermis is the thick portion of our skin that gives us the structure. The collagen and elastic fibers are found there. And then below it, what sort of insulates us, the subcutaneous fat. If you look at the epidermis even more closely, there are adnexal structures that are important. The hair follicle usually attaches to the sebaceous gland that secretes sebum, and right at the hair bulge is where the stem cell lies. And we also have some apocrine gland in our skin and also eccrine gland that's important for sweating uh, and other um, temperature regulated mechanism. I told you a little bit about the epidermis, and again, the epidermis is not just a single layer of skin that doesn't do anything, but it's really sophisticated. Here you can see the epidermis. In our skin, it's about 50 to 100 microns thick, and the epidermis is divided by the basement membrane um, with the dermis. And I'll show you a little bit later what the structure of the basement membrane is like. But for right now, the basal cell sits right at the top of the basement membrane, and that's where transient empathy amplifying um, cells reside, and these cells have the ability to differentiate and proliferate. Most of the keratinocytes express a molecule called keratin, and although we know that it gives us a skin a cell structure, we don't really understand what they do. The functions are not clear, but what we do use the keratin markers for in dermatologies to kind of locate where the skin cells are. So the basal cells express keratin 5 and 14, and as the keratinocyte differentiates and moves up, they start to downregulate those keratin molecules, and then keratin 1 and 10 is upregulated. In a hyperproliferative state, such as psoriasis, then the, a, a different set of keratin gene comes in, keratin 16 and 17. So it gives us dermatologists some clues to how cells are functioning. As the cells become more rounded, larger, with larger nucleus, uh, they start to differentiate and form keratohyaline granules, the granules that are found in the skin cells, and they have a lot of lipids there. So what happens later as they, the cells become flat and dies off and loses its nuclei is um, the, the keratohyaline granules start to produce some lipids that are protective. So the dead layer up here, the stratum corneum, is really also incredible barrier. So it's a, it's a layer of cells that are very compacted without the nuclei, but it also has not just a proteinaceous envelope, but some lipids surrounding it, protecting our body so the microorganism and other toxins and, and agents can't go through the skin. There are three cells within the epidermis that dominates, and one of them is, our, is the keratinocytes. So keratinocytes make up most of our epidermis. And again, as I mentioned, they express keratin molecule. Now the skin is at, right at the entry site of microbes, so it really is an innate immune organ. And so the receptors that are involved in innate immune response are expressed in keratinocytes. We have complement receptors on keratinocytes, uh, adhesion molecules such as ICAM-1, class 1, and class 2 molecules, as well as innate receptor called toll-like receptors that can recognize pattern uh, from microorganism and then activate immune response. The Langerhans cells are also found in the epidermis, and these are sort of dendritic look looking cells, and what they do is recognize microbes that are found in skin and they're able to process them and activate immune response. 
The third set of cells, here's a Langerhan cell, it's expressing uh, CD1A, Langerhan, also class two, and some Burbick granules. The third set of cells are melanocytes, and these cells are able to give us our skin color. What's interesting is that even though uh, people have different skin color, the number of melanocytes found in skin are very similar between all of us. What's different are the melanosomes and the melanin product that these melanocytes produce. So a darker individual may have melanosomes that contain more increased in number of melanin and also larger melanin. And the lighter individual have, have less melanin, but the number of melanocytes are really the same. Another difference is that the darker individual will have something called eumelanin, the brown-black melanin, and these melanin are able to absorb UV light and also um, kind of quench up the reactive oxygen species that are found with cellular damage, and so they're very photoprotective. The lighter skin individual don't have as many eumelanin, but rather they have the feel melanin that are yellow and red melanin, so they, they're not as photoprotective. So again, as, as I mentioned, the skin is an incredible barrier, and you can see just by the description I gave you that the, really the stratum corneum, the dead layer of skin, as well as the keratinocytes all really impede penetration of microbial organism, chemical irritants, and toxins. They're also able to uh, uh, absorb and block solar radiation also inhibit water loss so we don't get dehydrated and regulate temperature. So some example of what happens, the stratum corneum, which to some people doesn't seem very important, these patients with epidermolytic hyperkeratosis don't have the compact stratum corneum. So just that single change allows the loose stratum corneum to allow penetration of microbes. So these patients get recurrent bacteria infection. A disease called toxic epidermal necrolysis is, is a nice demonstration of what happens if you damage the keratinocytes. So this is a disease that happens sometimes due to some drug reaction. Patients may take some antibiotics, for example, that can go to our skin and causes the keratinocytes to necrose. And then so what happens is that the patients lose the top layer of the skin, sloughs off, and what you end up having is dehydration, increase in water loss, inability to control infection, and patients have very, very high increase in mortality with this disease. One example of what happens if you don't have melanin is a disease called oculo um, cutaneous albinism. This young boy looks very fair, and it initially you may not think too much of it, but this is the color of his mother's hand. So he's lost pigment. The, the reason is because he's missing an enzyme, tyrosinase, which make up melanin. So patients with ocular cutaneous albinism have high incidence of um, skin cancers and also increased in photo damage. As I mentioned, skin has an inherent ability to maintain our homeostasis. What's interesting is that the water loss is not really static, but changes throughout the day. And the temperature, too. So they both go up during the night, and the sebum production is high at noon. And very recently, it's been shown that um, the, the, the skin actually express clock genes. We in, our other, we in our laboratory and also others have demonstrated that certain clock genes are expressed. And so we're trying to study this right now to see if we can actually um, utilize this physiology to deliver certain therapeutics at different times. This is a work, a lot of work um, done in Christopher Colwell's group here and Jean Block's group as well. And they haven't really looked at skin, but this is something that we're planning to do. So what are some protective mechanisms in detail um, against pathogen, UV radiation, um, skin injury? The cells can go through apoptosis, nucleotide repair, wound healing, and also innate immune response, which I'll focus on. So first, skin protects us from UV damage. If you walk into my office and clinic or any dermatologist will tell you the worst thing that you can do is go, go out in the sun. And that's because UV radiation can damage the skin. 
There are three types of UV ultraviolet radiation, but we don't receive really that much UVC on the Earth, Earth's atmosphere because it's absorbed by the ozone layer. So here you can see the UVB damage. The, what UVB damage does is increase uh, sunburn cells and lead to immediate sunburn. The deeper UVA, which is a, a longer wavelength, so it penetrates more, causes more photo damage. This is an interesting patient. Um, he worked in an office for 15 years at the same desk in the same location. His left side had a window and um, his right side didn't. And you can see the incredible damage on that, on that side because UVB doesn't go through window, but UVA does. Skin cancers, one of the most common cancers that we see um, are, are really caused by both UV and UVB, not only because of the DNA damage, but also there's immunosuppression that can occur. So activation of um, some of the skin cells and innate response could increase certain inhibitory cytokines to inhibit some cellular response um, and decrease in immunity. So again, what do we do to protect against our, our skin, it's the UV damage that we get every day, such as today, it's really beautiful and sunny, but really the first thing that stratum corneum does is to reflect the UV light. The melanin, it's a really wonderful chromophore, so it absorbs UV and takes up the reactive oxygen species. And then the keratinocytes that are damaged upregulate tumor suppressor genes such as P53 and then lead to apoptosis of certain damaged sun sunburn cells. UV damage also leads to really signature change in DNA, and these are called permitting dimers. The cyclobutane permitting dimers, and then also the 6,4 PPSs are formed, and that's a signature damage from UV. And we have an inherent mechanism that protects us every single time we go out in the sun. And I think, even me, I think all of us take for this for granted, but every single time we go out there, this is being activated. And the nuclear um, tide excision repair occurs as such. So you have these uh, permitting dimers occurring, the DNA opens up, our endonucleus cuts off away those damaged nucleotide, and then the DNA the polymerase comes and fixes it, and the ligase comes and ligates it. An example of why we shouldn't take this mechanism for granted are pa because patients such as uh, who have xeroderma pigmentosum. These patients um, have autosomal recessive DNA repair genetic uh, disease. They're not able to go through the enzyme repair, the, uh, the nucleotide repair that I just told you about. So any sun damage can, can lead to early skin cancer and photo damage. They usually live um, with a large suit and they're mostly moving around um, at night. And when they go to school, they have to ask the schools to protect certain protective UV filters in, in, in their windows. And that's not something that's really easy. This is a young girl that I've been taking care of for a long time. She's eight years old now, and we've done multiple skin cancer surgery. I've done all the multiple skin cancer surgery on her already. So as you can see, the small repair mechanism that we just have does us a really lot of good. For these patients, there's no cure right now. People have tried to use some, some D DNA repair enzymes and place it in liposomal uh, cream delivery. Um, and this study by Yarish demonstrated that you can get 68% reduction in new precancer actinic keratosis and 30% reduction in formation of skin cancer. However, the follow-up studies have not been so good um, for, for many reasons probably, but mostly because delivery of certain, certain therapeutics through skin is not so simple and easy. The second thing that skin does is promote wound healing, and I think this is another thing that we may take for granted. We walk around with cuts on our fingers and legs all the time, and probably 99% of times, you don't worry about it, it heals itself. You don't run to a plastic surgeon or a dermatologist to sew this up. And that's because we have a very nice wound healing mechanism. Right away, immediately when there's a cut, clotting factors um, are upregulated and clot formation occurs, and then inflammatory phase occurs within minutes to hours to days. 
the inflammatory cells such as mast cells, neutrophils come, and then they start to secrete some growth factors that will activate keratinocytes and other um, cells within the dermis such as fibroblasts to heal and to proliferate and remodel. So this is a, a sort of cartoon of clot formation here, activation of many different um, chemotactic factor that will recruit innate cells and, and inflammatory cells, and those cells produce uh, growth factors such as fibroblast growth factors and TGF, and then in, in turn, what that does is these growth factors will allow the skin to heal in radially as well as up by granulation formation. Wound healing is affected by several factors, mostly age, elderly patients don't heal as well, immune status, immunocompromised patients don't heal as well, and it also depends on your health. For example, if you have comorbidities such as diabetes, then you're going to heal very slowly. The third thing that the skin does is protect us from microbes. If you really think about it and kind of just really appreciate it and look at your skin right now, it's a very beautiful organ. Um, I think it's amazing that we're not inflamed all the time. We should be inflamed all the time with all the stuff that's going on in this world, but we're not. So while in immunology in my field, everyone's focusing on inflammation and we have a lot more information on this right now, what I hope to study in the future is what are some genes and what are some mechanisms that keeps us in homeostasis? What are some down-regulating mechanisms? Recently, a uh, cytokine termed IL-37 is thought to play that role, and we're going to be looking at this. But for right now, we don't really know how we can stay so beautiful. Um, so when the pathogen comes in through a breakthrough skin, then it activates our innate cells, the keratinocytes, and innate cells do two things at least, induce antimicrobial response and also inflammatory response, and keratinocytes can do both. Also, the Langerhans cells are able to pick up the, the microbe, process it, go down to the draining lymph node and activate other uh, immune response such as adaptive immune cells and activate T cells. In general, all these myeloid cells that are, are, uh, that are recruited into skin are not found in normal skin. But if there's inflammation or there's infection, then these cells are recruited and they take up the antigen or microbe. And what they do is also, just like the keratinocytes, induce various mechanisms of antimicrobial response as well as inflammatory response. And sometimes inflammatory response is good, allowing us to, to heal, but sometimes they're bad, having fever and sepsis and tissue destruction. So innate response is really a balance of doing some good and really making sure that it's not causing too much inflammation. Uh, one cell in the dermis that are really um, that is really beautiful, or, and I just wanted to show you our dendritic cells, and these cells are not just important phagocytic cells, but they're critical for activating the adaptive immune response. The two cells that make up adaptive immune response, or two subsets, I should say, are B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. The B cells become plasma cells, and they streak immunoglobulins. The T cells, on the other hand, recognize peptides, and they present our, uh, and, and these cells are important for uh, binding a peptide with class one or class two molecule. There are two different types of, or I should say there are more, but major types of T cells that we, we talk a lot about are T helper cells and T cytotoxic cells. The helper cells secrete certain cytokines and they've been subcategorized as a Th1, Th2, and now Th17 cells, and they do different functions through to maintain immunity. The Th1 cells are important for cell-mated immunity. The Th2 cells are important in general for humoral immunity, and Th17 cells have been shown to mediate some autoimmunity. And all these T, T cells will determine the outcome of infection. The cytotoxic T cells, on the other hand, recognize infected cells and kill them either through fast, fast ligand pathway 
or granulocytic pathway utilizing an antimicrobial called granulysin. The T cells that are activated in the lymph node by the Langerhans cells I told you have the ability to come back to the tissue where the infection is. And sometimes they play a critical role in healing, but sometimes they cause disease. For example, in psoriasis, which is a very common skin condition, it's thought that um, some of the, the problem that this happens is not only because of the excessive cellular proliferation, but also because there are too much Th1 and Th17 cytokine. So, it's, so some of the pharmaceutical company are using biologics to block the downstream um, inflammatory response. So some of the agents we use are, for example, TNF blockers, and recently the IL-23 blocker so that can improve some, some psoriatic patients. The fourth thing that skin does is to convey inner health. There's a real connect between what's going on inside and outside. Um, I used to, before I went into dermatology, we would go on rounds, and dermatology always had about 20 people in the hospital, all in one group walking around. Um, in, I remember looking at, I don't know if you know, some of you remember Dr. Newcomer, but 20 students following him around, he was so knowledgeable, and he would look at something and just tell us what it is. And as I got to learn a little bit more from her and from him, and I got to know and learn dermatology, I was doing that as well. Not, not as well as him, but that's because it wasn't really magic, but rather that skin shows some conditions that's going on inside to the outside. Diabetic have these sort of a, a necrobiosis lesion. We can see that lupus patients often uh, it have the butterfly rash, we call. Um, the cili people with celiac disease have uh, very, very itchy bumps on their elbows and knees um, called dermatitis herpetiformis. Sarcoy patients can have granulomatous reaction as seen here. And some keratotic papules can develop in patients with renal failure. Another thing that skin does is convey beauty and attractiveness, and it sounds kind of really superficial, um, but I think I bring it to you and I thought, well, should I include this or not? But I wanted to because it's not something that's really new, and I think that it is part of our world. Um, even before, you know, in 1820, in 1800s apparently, this couple was the couple. I have never heard of him, but a, a portrait artist, Thomas Lawrence, and others used this couple as, as the beautiful couple and painted them. And I think now, some of you may or may not agree, but you know, this, this is a couple that people seem to, to obsess over. The point is that, um, it really, I wanted to bring it, not because I want us to think about just beauty, but because people who are affected with skin disorder <coughs> lives around this society. And that's why they have such low self-esteem. Um, imagine walking around with some of the uh, you know, clinical findings I showed you. So while some people sort of say dermatology may not be so important, my view is that we're very important. And another thing is that um, you can do a whole lot using your science to help our patients. Um, this is just an example of what's going on in our world. You know, over the last, um, you know, during this really hard economic times, plastic surgeons are doing very well because there's been 775% increase in cosmetic plastic surgery treatments. And even in um, non, non-surgical treatments, I mean, look at the number of patients who are getting these kind of treatments. And it makes people feel better. Uh, I have some patients that are referred to me from breast cancer center. And um, what I found from them, the, these women, are that doctors, some doctors don't listen to them because what means a lot to them is how they look while they're going through a lot of things. And, um, and, and we tend to, as physicians, really focus sometimes on a real serious things. And even though this may not seem serious to, to, to many people, it is for some patients. And so, so the aesthetic or the way we look plays a significant role in, in how, how well we feel. It's so much so that millions of and billions of dollars are spent by consumers 
So I want to um, now go over some interdisciplinary collaborative work that we're doing on campus. This is hopefully not too shocking to you. It's a horrific disease. Um, I also thought about should I include this or not, but we're not eating it right now. So um, this is epidermal lysis bullosa. EB is a genetic connective disorder where blistering occurs due to a mutation either in keratin molecule or in collagen gene. I talked about both of those uh, proteins earlier. There's no cure. Um, some people are trying gene therapy. David Woodley at USC has been trying to put collagen 7 and delivering it through skin and have not been successful as of yet. And maybe some of you in the audience can help us with this. Um, patients have significant morbidity, obviously, with increase in skin infection and poor wound healing. Um, and poor wound healing will lead to sort of clubbing of the foot and lead to skin cancer, and they get amputation and so on. Most of these kids with um, in their uh, severe case don't reach their 20s. So remember I told you that nice thin basement membrane that just looked like somebody took a pen and, and crossed it. But w what it is, it's, it's this very sophisticated structure with lots and lots of proteins that are important. And for EB recessive dystrophic patients, they're just missing this one little protein called collagen 7 that goes from the basement membrane to the dermis. And with that mutation, skin sloughs off. Oftentimes we call these patients butterfly children because their skin is so like a butterfly, very, very fragile. You grab at them and their skin falls apart. Um, we have a camp for these um, kids and other kids with very severe skin condition. And because there's no cure and because they don't have this amazing organ skin that's normal, we have to wrap them up to try to protect them from all those things that I just talked about, UV, microbes, and all. So they live in a dressing. They come with um, two large boxes to our camp, and it takes us about five hours to change their dressing for each child. Um, and so you can imagine the cost of the dressing, which usually are not covered by, usually it's not covered by insurance. So um, in addition to EB, because very small number of patients, about one in 70,000 patients are affected with the dystrophic EB, we need to sort of convince the pharmaceutical companies that they still need to do wound healing research so we can help all kinds of people. And so, so I ca categorize this to just, not to only talk about EV, but to really think about wound healing. It's estimated that three to six million persons are affected with chronic wound in the US. And it generates over 1.6 million ER visits and close to a million visits in the hospital stay. The overall cost of wound care is about $10, $10 billion annually. So you can imagine the negative health and societal and economic impact it has not just in the U.S. but worldwide. Not just chronic wound, but I do most micrographic surgery. And for most patients, when I do the repair, it takes them long time to heal if you are elderly. So anything that we can do to enhance their wound healing process would be useful in my everyday practice. Furthermore, I told you that sometimes health has something to do with wound healing, and diabetics are, diabetics are particularly vulnerable. Up to 43% uh, patients with diabetic foot ulcers eventually end up getting amputation, and if you have, are an amputee, the mortality after five years is about 68%. So in general, I think there's a need to, to study wound healing more and to try to develop therapeutics for some of these patients. And I have been really fortunate to meet Dr. Maynard. I don't think she's here, but Heather and I and Lloyd Miller in our group are trying to, to try to come up with some kind of a novel idea. Um, we think that we know that growth factors are important for wound healing. So we want to try to replace this natural occurring growth factor to he help wound healing process. Um, we know that beta FGF is involved in re-epithelialization and granulation of tissue. Uh, but the problem with just putting protein back into our skin is that they break easily. They don't, they degrade in, in, in not just in skin, but also in storage. So 
Heather's an incredible chemist, and so basically what she thought was she can um, make some heparin mimicking polymers and attach it to the beta FGF. And what that what we're showing is that that creates more stable beta FGF and also um, more mitogenic in that, that that it induced dimerization also binding of uh, this sort of uh, polymer linked heparin to bind to the the FGF receptor better. So our early study demonstrates that in comparison to the the native beta FGF, the growth factor, if we change it with the polymer, heparin mimicking polymer, then we can enhance the cell growth. And so our hope is that eventually we can try to develop something that's synthetic and to uh, be able to deliver this to skin and to increase wound healing. Um, in that, by trying to test, we've developed a human skin equivalent culture that we're going to use. It's a sort of a, you know, it's hard to test all this in humans, so it's a, in vitro we can create human skin and then test these new molecules that we're creating. And then, um, luckily, one of my colleague in our dermatology, Lloyd Miller, studies uh, staph wound healing, and staph aureus is a, an important pathogen for uh, that inhibits wound healing process. So he and I, with along with Jamie Zussman, who was in our laboratory, created a very superficial wound healing model. This is just by scarification, we, and we show that mice heals within 10 days. And then we added different staph concentration and, and show that the wound healing is delayed um, as you increase the bacterial count. And just having this model, we can try to test some of the things that Heather and, and we are developing. Um, to make sure that this model would work um, when we finally do come up with a nice uh, growth factor is that we we try to um, we tested a, a antibiotic ointment that we normally use after surgery, and we can show that we can actually follow these mice, and and show that uh, the presence of antibiotic ointment can decrease uh, the healing time as well as decrease the Staph aureus count in the wound. The second collaboration I want to talk to you about is using um, studying a, a very, very common skin condition, acne vulgaris. Um, it's kind of a joke, like, oh, what do dermatologists do? It's actually pretty hard to get into dermatology, and then we end up, I think the public thinks that the only thing we do is start, s treat acne, um, <laughs> and it's not important. But again, I, th I think it's my responsibility to show you that um, Acne is actually a really serious uh, problem for many people. Um, and it's also a really interesting disease because it's an immune-related disease. Um, almost everyone of us in this room have had acne at some point in our, their lifetime. And it affects millions of people in the U.S. and worldwide. There's no predilection for ethnicity or gender. Teenagers are, are particularly affected or young adults. And what that does is it really, again, lowers their self-esteem. Just in the last two weeks in my acne clinic, we've had young, young, two young boys come in separately, and one boy didn't want to go to, a young man didn't, he refuses to go to school. He's from a very, very well-to-do family. He has everything in that he could ask for, um, amazing parents uh, at a wonderful school, but his acne kind of looked like something in between the two, and he's so embarrassed that he can't go to school. And so this is a serious disease, and I think that there's really not too much that we can do as of yet, because what's happening is that um, we don't really understand this disease. There are many different factors that are um, involved in acne, including altered keratinization, um, sebum production, hormones we think are involved in a bacteria on our skin called propionibacterium acnes, and also the host immune response. So because we don't really know what exactly causes it or how much of all everything plays a role, what we have been doing in, in dermatology is really utilizing two different uh, category of therapy. One is the antibiotics. We know that if you decrease the P-acnes count, the acne can improve. 
The problem is that we're using antibiotics so much that resistance is forming. And about, in certain areas, about 75% of P. acne is now resistant to the antibiotic that we use for, for treatment. The second category that really works for acne are the retinoids, vitamin A. We use that topically, the retin-A, you probably heard, or isotretinoin. And, and because these retinoids have side effects, some people can't use retinoids because they're irritating. And the isotretinoin uh, causes birth defect. And recently, it's, it's very political, but because a young boy who is a you know, very prominent person's son committed suicide, it's been very difficult for dermatologists to use this drug. We know this drug works, but people don't want to take it uh, orally. So we're trying to develop better therapy for acne. In my laboratory, uh, I trained with Robert, who's sitting over there, and during my PhD, he was studying, you know, I learned, I learned a lot of immunology using leprosy as a model, and, and it turns out that mycobacteria and propionibacterium have a very similar structure. And, and he was studying toll-like receptors, and we looked to see if P. acnes could possibly activate the innate re receptor, toll-like receptor, and we found that P. acnes induces, activates toll-like receptor 2 and activates either cytokine pathway or uh, sort of collagen pathway. So a lot of times um, acne, unlike some skin infection, causes scarring. And it may be that it's because the, not just because the P. acnes induces so much inflammation, but because P. acnes through TLR2 activates metalloproteinase and collagenase that breaks up collagen. We found in our lab that, again, the all-trans retinoic acid, which, which is like a retinoid, vitamin A, could inhibit both pathways. And again, I told you that this is a hard drug to use, so I approached Lenny, and um, he was working on curing lung cancer, and I said, oh, forget that, I think we should. <laughs> work on skin, and um, he's so generous and open-minded that he didn't turn me away, and he said, okay, fine, you know, maybe we could look at skin cancer, and I said, well, let's work on skin cancer a little later, but how about utilizing your technology for acne, and he was very uh, supportive, and as some of you know, he works on vault system, which is a naturally occurring cytosolic ribonucleus protein. And, and it's a very interesting molecule because it's got a barrel sh shape, but it's hollow inside, so it's perfect to put some therapeutics in there. His lab has shown that if you take, there are three proteins that the vault has and one untranslated RNA. And what's interesting is if you just express one of these proteins, the major vault protein, then it can reassemble itself and it's shown here, this is his work and his laboratory's work, and mostly I think Valerie's work. Um, and they show that if you take the major vault protein and, ins and place this gene in an infectious piece of DNA and then insert that gene into an insect cell, then the vault will, will assemble itself. And then um, because I wanted to work on retinoids, Daniel Bueller in his laboratory said, well, if retinoids are really lipophilic, then I have another na nano delivery system that you might be interested. And so he told me a little bit about nanodisc. Nanodisc are small discoidal lipid bilayer fragments. And it's a truncated version of apolipoprotein A1. And it has an amphiphilic helices, and it provides a really rich area. It kind of looks like an ice cream sandwich, actually. And what that can do is he can synthesize um, the vault in a way to, so that he can put a vault interactive domain here in red. And then if he attaches the INT domain to the nanodisc, then it will reassemble, the vault will reassemble itself with his nanodisc in it. So, we tried this. We made a nano he made, not nano disc, with our retinoids in here, the iontine domains sticking out. And then with the vault, he was able to show that the nano disc with our retinoids went into Lenny's vault and made 100 copies per vault. So that's a lot of retinoids that we can possibly deliver. 
um, we showed the biological effect in that, I don't want to bore you with a very busy slide, but remember, P. acnes induces cytokine, and if you, you add the, the vault system, then you can inhibit this cytokine response, um, showing that the, the retinoids um, are getting to to, through the vault, releasing it somehow and decreasing inflammatory response induced by P. acnes. Another thing, nice, about, nice thing about vault is that uh, Lenny's group can attach an antibody to target specific cells. And he shows this, they show this by a, attaching anti-EGFR receptor that will go to cells that express EGFR. Um, and it's really hard to deliver acne therapy to the pilosebaceous gland. Sebocytes are quite deep inside um, from the surface of the skin. So if we can attach an antibody that specifically targets sebocyte, we believe that we can deliver therapeutics much better to, to sebaceous glands. Um, one of the things that we hope to do is take advantage of our natural and uh, um, immune response and utilize it for therapy. And so while um, um, developing therapy, utilizing some synthetic um, compound might be interesting, but we also wanted to look at this, and this is a work that um, I started in, in, again, Robert Modlin's lab. Granulysin is a antimicrobial protein that's found in, in NK cells and T cells. And it's located, um, it's really um, highly conservative, conserved from host defense. Uh, amoeba forests even have it, and it's been in conserved, and it has ability really to kill not just bacteria, but many different pathogens. Uh, Robert's lab um, and, and his postdoc showed that granulysin can kill lots of different types of microorganisms, as shown here. So, the way that granulysin works, and it was crystallized from, by um, Dan Anderson and David Eisenberg's group here, it has five helices, and it's able to poke holes to create cell, cell necrosis or damage, killing of cells through osmotic lysis. So theoretically, since it's not affecting the machinery of bacteria, resistance should not occur. So we decided, again, going back to something skin, maybe we should try this on acne. And so um, we tested this in a, in a comodonal environment where there's a lot of lipid-rich lipid environment, and we demonstrated that the granulysin peptide can kill P. acnes, as shown here. And this is, um, by working on uh, and truncating some of the granulysin, we found a 15-mer peptide that had a really high activity as long as it expand helix two, loop helix three, that it remained activity, and we altered it a little bit, getting some help from Dan. He felt, felt that the position, the valine position at uh, amino acid position 44 could be uh, modified with a very large benzene ring like tryptophan um, to kind of poke hole. He theorized that that's where uh, the granulysin was interacting with mi microbe. So we did that and we showed that this modified granulysin peptide can really shrunk, shrink up um, P. acnes and kill it and change. You can see the, the normal uh, cell membrane of the bacteria and the change that's occurring here. So. I think um, that with all these interactions that going on, on campus, you know, we might be able to mix some of the things that Heather's working on, for example, the growth factors, along with granulysin peptide and possibly retinoids. And there's so many things that we can do in combination. And, and I bring it up to you because I think that there are um, physical scientists or or biological scientists or even engineer scientists that might be able to help us in, in, in treating skin diseases. The last collaboration that I never thought I would interact with someone in computer science is it's just so interesting that I wanted to share with you. In medicine, the medicine's changing significantly and more people are trying to provide health services using uh, high technology telecommunication. 
one of the things that we're doing in dermatology is teledermatology. So dermatologists are hard to find. There are people all over the world who can have access to dermatology. And this is something we started at the VA so we can reach out to some veterans who are far away not getting this kind of service. So uh, a dermatologist sits in his office or her office uh, somewhere out there in remote area where there's no dermatologist, the photos are taken, either it's stored and forwarded or it's an instant um, interaction. And, and one of the things that, um, that we're trying to do now with uh, Deborah Estrin is to maybe, since computers are so bulky and perhaps it's um, not everyone has access, um, we're utilizing cell phone technology or we hope to utilize cell phone phone technology to reach out to some people. Um, again, my interest is really to show that, um, that we can reach out to certain people and make a difference in their lives. And so one of the things that we hope to do is the teens who can't come to our clinic, um, mostly in the underserved area, I mean, they're so good with their cell, cell phones. Um, maybe not to treat, but to interact with them, to encourage them to keep using their therapy because acne is a very chronic condition and you, the, one of the problems is that compliance is very low in patients who are young. So kind of keeping them motivated, interacting with them, telling them about side effects, why they shouldn't give up, and so on. And so that's our project. Um, a study was done um, by, oops, I forgot the name, Armstrong et al. at UC Davis. And what she did was utilize cell phone to remind patients to use their sunscreen every morning. I guess it could be really annoying, but, but what, what they found was that um, the, the use of sunscreen for patients who got the text reminder increased by 50%. So um, we're developing this really um, kind of sophisticated because of Deborah, but very unsophisticated on my part. And, you know, we'll say to the young teens, great, keep it up. <laughs> you know, if you're using benzoyl peroxide, maybe they're going to stop use it, but we might give them a tip, like don't use it at night. Put a towel on your, uh, on your pillow and, and, and encourage them um, to continue therapy. So this is uh, an area that I never thought I would utilize in dermatology, but it's, again, another... Um, kind of reminder that we need to reach out to, to many people on our campus to do some really cool projects. So I'd like to um, end with that. I wanted to just give you a little tidbits of hopefully what I, I, I communicated to you is the importance of skin, how, what a wonderful organ that is to protect our body. Don't take it to, uh, for granted because of all those patients that you saw who are affected um, if something goes wrong. And then opportunity for many of you to help us advance science and dermatology. And I want to thank everyone, our collaborators that are listed on here. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.